Um, we've got Anja from Hamburg, who's going to not only talk about the toolkit, but perhaps may well ask us about the toolkit and some ideas, because this project is interesting on so many levels. Um, and the level that we're really looking to this afternoon is the really nitty gritty of what we can produce, how we can produce it, how it can really target end users as well. Now I know um, in, in the audience we've got a couple of end users, but people who may well be looking at our toolkit and saying, oh, I work in a hospital, I work in a school, how can I maximize the potential of um, multilingualism? What are the good stories? What can I do? And I like this idea of of, of Joe's, which I've now sort of tried in my mind to go, aye, 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 what can we do? Well, I think it is the sort of thing, it's not aye, it's we, we, we. We have got to help this process of finding out what we can do and what we can find out. So really, this is the first opportunity we've had um, in a group of people who know the project, part of the project, people in the group have come in to find out about the project, and then users to listen about this idea because what we want to do is produce something that is of real help and by having a good discussion um, we'll be able to tell Anche and the team back in Hamburg and then we've got the rest of the afternoon to really look and I'll talk about this a little bit afterwards the, some of the key issues that you and Varna have come up with saying this is a seminar in South Eastern Europe, in Bulgaria and we want themes and topics that are important for us, but also are important for the whole of the Balkan area, but also have a resonating effect across the whole of Europe and beyond. And I think we've got some three very good themes there as well. And the idea is that everyone will talk about the themes, the colours on your car, reveal your groups, and move from one to another. The whole group will stay here. There are two discussion zones outside. That's the airline through that, wasn't it? <laughs> and um, it will give you an idea to talk in small groups. Some good examples of what the worries are, things that you have, possible solutions, ideas, even you know, really sort of putting there what the what the key situations are. And then we'll be sort of putting the panelists together at the end of the day and um, also discussing them. So Anja, the two. You want to hear more? Yes. Sorry, over to my colleague as well. There. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. And I'm pretty sure that we fully charge the batteries after the refreshment lunch that we all had in the garden. And it's my pleasure to give the floor to Anja. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, both of you, yeah, this session is on toolkit. And I'm really happy that we have now about one hour talk about toolkits, um, which is an outcome of the Lucid project, a really precise outcome that we promised to deliver. I'm really happy that so many people, project partners, are here today because the University of Hamburg is the work package leader, but the toolkits are really something that needs to be developed by all the project partners um, of UC. So we are here today and I hope we can use the session to discuss and to get input from everyone on how they should look like, how they should be shaped, how they should be structured. Um, and uh, the toolkit is something that all the knowledge that we have created by now from uh, the data analysis, from the interviews, from our city reports should feed into. But the outcome has to be something really like precise and something useful um, that people from the practice can use in order to use um, multilingualism more efficiently and really use the benefits of multilingualism. So the question for us, as Joe uh, talked about, is really how to make it relevant for them, how to define it, that they can actually use it and do something with it. And, um, yeah, what I'm going to present to you now is going to be really a first homage that we have uh, thought of after um, the workshops, because in the workshops we have formulated some um, policy implications. So we have five workshops on the five spheres, 
And the outcome of each workshop was to find some policy indications, some advice for practitioners. For practitioners. And uh, first of all, I would like to um, develop somehow what a toolkit really is. And I guess every one of you knows what a toolkit is. Um, but the question is, how can we use it for the context of the DC project? And I would like to start by uh, deriving that from a definition of a real toolkit. So, you know basically that a toolkit is a container that contains tools. And the tools should be useful, hopefully, to fix a certain problem. And the tools are related, uh, are arranged in the container in certain related areas so that the person who wants to use the tools can quickly find them and use the tools in order to build and fix more efficiently and economically. What would be not so helpful in the toolkit is if the tools are all thrown together, so they should be sorted in the areas so people that can find them quickly can find them easily. And also, um, if a tool is put in a different place, I know my father would always kill me for doing that, for putting the tools in the right places. So, and um, also in this way they can easily found. And also if the tools themselves, even if you find a tool and the tool is not, if the knife is not sharp, or um, I don't know if the, if the handle is missing, or if the battery is not charged, or whatever, the tool itself is not helpful. So you can also forget about the tool. So, but what does that mean for the seat if we apply this technical definition to the seat project? Um, one definition could be, and again, as I say, this is only the first basis, the first foundation, so this needs to be shaped and discussed with you. Um, okay, so the aim of the LACID project is to make better use of the resource of multilingualism and plurilingualism for our society. Thus, our toolkit should contain measures targeted at specific groups of society, which could be the containers or parts of the certain containers on how to use multilingualism and plurilingualism as a resource. And the tools could be grouped in containers, and these containers, if you apply them to a project, could be the five spheres of societies that we have used the structure from the beginning of the project. So let's imagine we have a toolkit and we have a toolkit with these containers. Here they are, whereas if we have a question, we have to see later on if private is really a container that can contain a lot of tools. But, well, this is the structure that we should discuss. If this is a good structure for a toolkit, if these containers are useful for people from the outside, or if we need different containers. And um, what we could also do is to uh, give hints to people searching for the tools what is contained in each container because if the economy if somebody is looking for advice and he doesn't know maybe if he belongs to the public or private somebody maybe from fever that can be private or public or maybe somebody from the health sector which can be private or public we can give hints um, and it is for the economic sphere so that you can know if you're a company you can look in this container. This could be the first level of the toolkit. And um, the second arrangement within the spheres, within the container, a second arrangement could be the target groups that belong to each sphere. And this is a suggestion of a second separation for the economic sphere. Um, so a further arrangement or further structure could be the plurilingual job seeker, the employer, the policy maker, and chamber of crafts or chamber of commerce. Whereas this could be questioned already if this doesn't belong to the policy maker. Um, as well, if they couldn't be grouped together, because 
um, the advice to them could be very similar. And if we have too many um, target groups, then we end up having the um, same advice again and again and it becomes repetitive. So this is the first suggestion for the economics group. And yeah, as I, as I mentioned, these are some thoughts on structuring the toolkit. So if we have too many target groups in each sphere, um, we are repeating our advice again and again. So maybe, maybe it's better to not separate the spheres of too many different groups. The advice that we give um, should be very clear, should be very precise, and as useful as possible which is redundant, but still a challenge, of course, to, um, to formulate it this way. Um, wherever possible, we should link the advice to certain websites that contain best practice examples of cities and also templates that already exist. So if we're saying, um, do a language audit in your company to find out what languages are spoken, and um, the employer <coughs> and there is a template somewhere away available, then this could directly be linked so he has this tool in his hand that he can start with it, so he doesn't have to develop it himself. And also the language we're using, we should think about it. Um, so we want to give advice, um, which means we should be giving a direct advice, but we shouldn't be demanding, maybe we're saying you have to do this, you have to do that, but rather encouraging. Like we could do this, we should do this, and think about doing this. And so I'll now give you examples of these tools, of this advice for two target groups: um, the plurilingual job seeker and also the employer. That we have come up with at the end of the workshop on the economic sphere, and that you can see how this advice could look like. Or basis of discussion. And um, important for this to know is that before giving advice to these target groups, we have come up with a list of advantages of multilingualism in the economic sphere, so that um, these advantages, they apply to all of them. So all of them could benefit um, from these advantages, they just have to use them in a different way. But when we always say, okay, multilingualism is an advantage in the economy, this is heard very often, but it's kind of abstract. So we're trying to define it more clearly, um, what example, what advantages we actually have. So this is not on the slide, but um, examples of this could be like communication with foreign colleagues, suppliers, or producers is more efficient in the target language because you have less misinterpretation and you can create greater trust. Foreign clients can be addressed more appropriately or when doing market research, access to more information can be obtained, plurilingual staff often possesses of networks in foreign countries. So these are some examples where we concretely or precisely name the advantages of multilingualism has for the whole community, so that which is relevant for everyone. And then we go and address the different target groups. And this you see here for um, plurilingual job seeker. So by saying that you have a competitive advantage for your language students, be aware of this, know it, and don't underestimate your language skills, especially for migrant languages, um, for, for their home languages, for their mother tongue. And another advice would be point out this um, competitive advantages, advantage and strength in the carburetor when you write a carburetor or in the job interview and match it to the job announcement, which means apply to companies that are looking for um, employers who have certain language skills, research for them, um, and, and then we could name sectors in which um, sectors where companies um, often use for um, plurilingual staff. And there are certain sectors um, that in which this is the case, and we could give a list of these sectors so that when doing a job research, one has a point to start. And other kind of advice. So the same is here for the, for the employer. This is, of course, from a different perspective. 
but the same advantages apply. So here the main, the first advice is to find out about the, um, the language competences of the um, employees, because often, uh, uh, employees, because often employees are not really not aware of the language spoken in the company. So do a language audit to find out what languages are spoken and also have them self have them assess self assess um, to which extent um, to which, or which proficiency these languages are spoken. And then there you at the end you have a list and you could this could be used um, whenever a certain language competence is needed. And also um, develop or, or sorry no, make the make your multilingual workers <coughs> aware that their language competence is valuable for the company give them the feeling that their languages are valued and that um, pluralingualism is an asset. Maybe this could be even broken down further by saying like which specific measures you could do in order to make it more. Okay, so this is a, some first examples for the atmosphere. And um, what are your thoughts on this structure? On this advice on this um, target groups on this whole procedure yeah. I think sometimes in some of those points it would be beneficial to add what 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 would you get from it because now you say for instance the first one make your multilingual workforce aware of their language competence uh, that their language competence are valuable for their company and I could think why? Why would I do that? As an employer who has, you know, not a multilingual freak, I'm just an employee, I want to get more money, I want my company functioning better. So it would be nice, to, you know, like in the, in the fourth bullet, you give it get very clearly, keep a list of the language competence of your employees in which you can quickly find a translator when needed. So you see why you should keep a list, and I know why you should keep a list now. But I don't know why I should make my multilingual uh, employee. Uh, uh. So define benefits. Yeah. So a uh, couple of advice to uh, to uh, uh, an advantage for for the employer for the for the employer. Yeah. And as I mentioned, um, in, in before each section, we have listed we have listed the advantages of multilingualism. So this is not shown right here now, but. Um, I mean, this could be either listed there in the introduction or directly with every advice. The so note comes repetitive there. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'll suggest making the actual list of the language contents is more uh, visible. So, for example, the uh, company website to have profiles of all people who work there and on their profile to say, you know, competencies in these languages so that, you know, people feel proud of it and it's part of their uh, professional profile. Mm -hmm. And you, as a company, you show yourself as an international company. Look at all those international people working here, so it's good mm -hmm. for the company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so on the home page to flag up, you know, our staff are multilingual and on their profile pages you find more languages they communicate. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I've just got a question. It, a lot of us here um, are employed by universities, and I'm going to see our human resources in the next couple of weeks because I, I, I don't, you know, I've, after being involved with the project, I'm thinking I actually don't know how they keep a record at the London School of Economics of people's uh, language disability. Um, and it's quite interesting, it's completely mixed the picture. So again, it's a little bit of, of, of thinking back to Joseph, how you can, without fighting and going confrontation, is, is ways that if universities that should be keeping an active record of the skills of their employees, because that's what we are at the end of the day, um, but, but it's interesting, if we, if we can get it right with the universities, our own, then it might be quite interesting to say, well, 
it may, might be a bit more understanding of other employers as well, because I've got a feeling that it's not going to be all good news. Um, a small point, a few months ago from LSE experts, they removed the section saying language competence is what language is spoken, and they put it back in again. So, um, because they, they wanted to shorten things. And again, what can they shorten something like language is? So that's brought back in again. Um, but again, I think it's, it's what we're seeing to hear. It's always ask the question, what's the reason to do it? Obviously, what's the reason to not do it? But how can I make it clear? How can I sell it? How can I make it apparent? And we do a language day at LSE every year. It's all about the students. But what we, I suppose we should be thinking is about the staff as well, you know, and, and making sure, because we say we're a multinational university at LSE. If you look at our website, it's monolingual stuff. So, I mean, universities are employers as well, and I guess that very few of them have um, know about the language competencies of their employers of maintaining lists. And so, this would be something that could, they could also make use of. We could like, pull some good advice quite quickly, actually, as well, to you as um, get some feedback. Yeah, that is something that Ingrid was actually planning at the end of the Hamlet workshop to do that, to start this at our own with our own employer. And it could be a little tryout test of this goes. <laughs> but what do you think about the, the structure of having five spheres as containers and then um, defining ta different target groups? Do you think there should be a lot of target groups defined or very few? Or do you think there should be a totally different structure of shaping the um, toolkit? I think in principle, I mean, we have to find a way of structuring it. So in principle, I think there's kind of a useful starting point. But however, I think once you do it, you will find there will be overlap. So the tools to advise for an employer and so on, there might be things there that might also be in the toolbox for how to speak to a local politician, a council, and so on, a uh, local government council. Some of this. I mean, obviously, sort of, you will see, I think you will find, once you actually go down to configure, you will find some, some overlap, and then maybe it's a matter of sort of fleshing out. But maybe you will find then again, after you've done it, broken it down, sort of find, you find again some overriding principles, which can then maybe feed again to the top. I think that could be a process. But in principle, I think uh, the structure could be a could be start. I think you, are, you, you seem very worried about repeating yourself and I was wondering if that's bad to have the same apply in different target groups because if I sit here, I'm not going to read everything, I'm just going to read what this is and if it's repeat ever, anywhere else, it doesn't matter, yes. as long as it's yes. easy to read. I think you're right, but just if it's like almost entirely the same advice that you would give to different target groups, you can, you can find them. But otherwise, I think so too. I mean, you're not going to read advice to, to every target group, so can you do that? Too? Yeah? I do like the structure, and I think it's, it's a really good start. Um, I do also wonder if it might be worth considering starting with um, maybe, I was going to say can do statements, <coughs> but the statements in terms of do you want to make your organization, it doesn't really matter if it's a, what kind of organization it is, but do you want to make your organization multilingual, for example, or do you want to know, or do you want to, you know, sort of start with the statements. I do wonder if things like the urban sphere is a really abstract concept to most end users, mm -hmm. and starting something like that, would that actually get people in who they be interested? Whereas if you start with a statement, a question that can be addressed, you know, to all, all kinds of organizations, employers, even a civil service, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. because, because, like you said, the underlying issues are pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. Pretty much, maybe not, maybe not in all sectors. I don't know. And I, I do wonder where things that we've, little case studies, you know, the, I know you talked about good practice examples, which could be the same as a case study or something, where 
we would then say, and this is this is the form that was used, you know, by this employer or something. Mm -hmm. Make it really. I, I always wonder about. Um, I might be a learner and I might be a teacher. I don't want a website that tells me I'm either or. Mm. Yeah. That, yeah, I don't know. Maybe you could say that, say that differently. Um, I just have a point to, to having case studies of good practice and examples of good practice, and I think, uh, yes, that makes this kind of guide a much better read. But uh, also in some reports in London, we had a report called uh, Languages for All, and they actually presented the facts in terms of loss of business if you don't speak local languages, and expressed that in billions of pounds, and I think if you're targeting people in the business world, if they read about loss of business through not speaking local languages, you know, that, that can be uh, also a good uh, you know, stimulus to engage more with um, language competency. So I think it's good to have both sides. You know, this is how good it can be if, if you engage with that, but also you, you can be at a loss if you don't. Any questions? Any so if you don't have, uh, you're not like explicitly saying this is for the learners, this is for the teachers. So isn't there a risk of um, having a lot of advice and then people having to pull out the ones which are useful to them and going through too many things which are irrelevant? Yes, then again, um, it depends a little bit on how you structure that. So if you start with statements like this, they could still filter later on, but it would give more of an inclusive impression when you first, um, maybe, I don't know, if I'm assuming a website or, or a tool, an online tool. I'm not saying that that is necessarily the, the way forward. Yeah. It's just another way of mm -hmm. Sorry, me again. Uh, I just would like to uh, also highlight the parents again because I think they are extremely vulnerable group. And can you talked about it this morning? The parents themselves don't see the value of maintaining first languages, and, and that's a big vacuum in terms of uh, advice to parents. Uh, it, who have bilingual children and who live in uh, bilingual families. And I think that would be a certainly a very different publication, very different guide than to you know, professional companies or uh, you know, learners or students. So I think parents should definitely uh, be something uh, uh, you know, that we need to think about separately. Mm -hmm. So they should be their own target, yeah. address in a different way than. Yeah. Yes, one thing, I mean, if you, if you just go back to the base of my original series, you might also sometimes see that it might be easier to identify target groups for, for some of these spheres than this for others. So you probably end up with more target groups, potentially with a lot more target groups uh, in some of these spheres than, than, than in the others. So, what do you, do you think you would find an equal number of target I mean, I don't think it's necessarily a problem. Yeah. But it might sort of just uh, be, be thinking about that also sort of something like the public sphere where well, it, it needs further, we need more containers sort of underneath that than, than we'll need for, for other spheres, possibly. Yeah, I guess this needs to be tied out once we develop um, the, the spheres. And in principle, I mean, I wouldn't say that they have to have an equal number of target yeah. for spheres, so as long as it makes sense. Um, yeah. so about what you're going to do with the, uh, you know, like the, the Chamber of Craft, <coughs> where if you're going to place them on two different spheres, or so that if I first, if I'm looking for, I'm a, you know, I, I work in the Chamber of Craft, and I just click on the first box, which was the public sphere, and then I don't find my target. So that's why I, I said it would be useful to, to list them explicitly on the first on level, the first, yeah. so that you know, when you are, when you are someone, um, interested in Chamber of Commerce, you think it could be the public, it could be either the economic sphere that you can see that in our structure it's grouped in the economic sphere. Yeah, but, uh, if it's not, I mean, if it, in the end it turns out that, you know, it's too big and it doesn't even fit in a page and it's too, not very functional, have you also considered, you know, just repeating it? 
Maybe that the two different spheres. Cross reference. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I don't know if it would be a. Uh, why not? Why not? Yeah. It's easier for people to find it and to use it. I mean, especially I mean, if this is going to be a website, we're not, so we don't have to have a linear. Yeah, I mean, there can be cross referencing, there can be. We are thinking um, of the printed version or the online version, because online you can do anything, you can use parts, so you don't really need to have a table. You can use parts and mm -hmm. um, that would create individual parts. Yeah. I don't know if there are a lot of arguments for having a printed version as well. Mm. So, I guess it's starting from. Yeah. And then we need to think it makes sense to have that. So on that, we can really go I think it's interesting to be from Bulgaria about you, you've got a country that, in a sense, the problems we have in multilingualism, I mean, we all share a common thread of problems with how to maximize multilingualism instead. But if you take the one aspect of of um, UK encouraging people to learn a language or maximise it, there's possibly a different situation or differing situations than you might have in there. If I oversimplify, in Bulgaria, it's always not the case that most people of a certain age want to learn English actively. It's a question of other definitions of language learning and indeed for others. But I'm interested to hear that you know, putting you either, because I know some of you are involved in, in business knowledge transfer um, and things, what sort of things you would look for or what you think employers would look for in a toolkit or indeed anything interesting to hear from, from some of you. Particularly you, Alexander, but in, in, the, in the development office as well, it's something you think, hmm, what I, what I really could do with is this, a, a web, I'd like this to appear on a website. Perhaps, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, perhaps uh, for some volunteers uh, outside the project, uh, perhaps it would be not so easy to find uh, the information uh, he she is looking for because uh, outside the project, perhaps uh, these employees and other groups will don't know what is the content of our campaign. I don't have a better idea. Yes, good point. But just uh, if uh, I'm uh, looking for some information, perhaps it will be a bit difficult. I have to go through that place to uh, understand what is the meaning of that container, that container, and things like that. Perhaps it could be thought of another. Uh, well, uh, not only one way of uh, arranging our tools, though uh, you said uh, we must um, put tools only uh, on one place, otherwise we can do a mess. But uh, still, perhaps outside it will be a bit difficult for people to use. So in a way we have to try to make it uh, more user friendly. Yes, because uh, actually surprisingly I was going to say exactly the same thing for a kind of uh, external look. What's the difference, for instance, between urban and public? Mm -hmm. For an, uh, an external reader, this is not obvious mm -hmm. because. Yes, so this there is point that we do interference. So if I'm looking for something specific, I won't know whether I should look in public or urban. Mm -hmm. So you mean on the level of the work we have the division of five spheres, we have to have an introduction and say yeah. what can be found in there. Or the different labels so that it is kind of more specific and immediately clear for us. Some kind of scheme, what where it is. Some kind of scheme, what where it is. So it's better, easier to find. I don't know if I agree with the uh, introduction to each sphere. 
suggestion that I think I heard. I think if I were a company or a policy maker, I would give up already. Mm -hmm. it, takes, it takes longer than 10 minutes to find what I'm looking for. And if I have to read everything before I know where to look for, I'm gone. I suppose what I'll you, Google it and hope I find it. What we're looking for is hooks, like, you know, why is multilingualism important for whatever field? What the examples are, what it can do, what the differences can be made, those sort of key things, and then how you can achieve this. And I think it's it's concentrating because it, it's like this classic thing that we have um, the, the, the framework of the like the academic side of our project is naturally the strengths and we're putting in for something that's a product of the academic side of the project, i.e. the practical side. Those original frameworks might have to be reflected in, in less obvious ways, perhaps. As you say, the, the differences between the urban and private, the, they might have to be signposted. It's not that we're, we're changing the shape or anything, but we're looking at what the end user wants and, and what it is. And I think you can always make things more complex. It's getting them simple that, that is, is the problem. Yeah. <laughs> but you're saying that we need different containers. We need different, different headlines for containers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. When you think of three eyes that you mentioned in Mobiaco's speech, we need uh, some containers that will raise interest. One of the three eyes that we mentioned earlier. So, how would this draw their attention? Why do they, why would they read this? How are we are going to make them read this? So, this is a really crucial question. Yeah. And Yeah, I, I, I was taken by what somebody said at the end, if you take your analogy of a toolkit, or our analogy of a toolkit, when you use the toolkit, you've got an idea in your head of what you want to do already. So I want to put up a shelf. And then you have some maybe maybe you're as stupid as I am. You might need to be told well you need screws and you need brackets and you need a screwdriver and a drill. And then you can put up a shelf. And what we don't have at the moment, I'm not sure whether that means we have to change the headings, but I think it might be from what somebody was saying, that somebody who is going to use this will, will come with a problem. Um, and that that needs, I think, probably to be defined. Well, my, my problem is we want to export more to China. Uh, or my problem is we have a lot of new immigrants in our schools and we don't know how to deal with it. And maybe we need to define what or consult more about what questions people would ask now, which would then enable them to find a route into different areas. I don't think the boxes are necessarily a problem, although I agree, we found that as well, didn't we? That urban and public, we made a distinction, but they kind of cross over quite a lot. And public, I imagine, is, is, might be a different set of boxes. That's actually going to be, I work in the health service, um, I'm a local government official, uh, I work in the legal sector, uh, it's about police or it's about different aspects. And so it, we might need different boxes. I think that's possible if we're talking about online things. Um, I think find that route. What I was saying is actually very much what Lid was just saying. <laughs> I hand the tools over to someone else. But usually, um, I see a lot of toolkits as an applied linguist in language education. There's lots of toolkits for primary sketch sector from Montessori for teacher trainers. But ultimately, we're trying to match up um, problems and solutions, suggested advice, suggested areas or pieces of advice. And it doesn't really matter what containers you put them in until you discover what advice you have and how much advice there is and what shape it takes, right? So perhaps we have to think about the content of our advice. I know that I would be interested in figuring how do I get my Russian language skills certified? I know all about English language proficiency testing. Can someone else point me towards how I validate my Russian skills? So I think your previous slides earlier on the types of advice are very helpful. We really know what shape something takes, and we can maybe skip ahead and not worry about our spheres that we fixed as a 
a theoretical framework for a discussion. This kind of thing is wonderful, and I know that I would click through and I would find a pathway and a, a possible flowchart of what I should do to get from A to B to C to D in my career. So I think we need to think about the shape and size of our tools and the advice before we worry about where we put them to push the analogy too far. Before we giving the advice, we need to define the target audience. Do we? Otherwise, advice to whom? But I, I think we're thinking as a resource. Because if we're going to get caught up, I think, in one of these chasing chicken and egg situations. Because ultimately, the advice is for lots and lots and lots and lots of different people, and we fall into lots of different roles and we wear different hats. And we don't know everything in our research project at all, so I think we need to think about what concrete advice we can give based on what we've done in our project and put it into some sort of nice box <laughs> that we worry about another day. But I'd be really interested to know but what kind of advice would be helpful in a southeastern European context and in an Irish yeah. context and a German context? And well, that, that's of course localization yeah. of this is actually, I think, is also crucially important. So that's quite exciting. Obviously, you will at one point go to, to, to the local level as well, won't you? Mm -hmm. Because there might be different solutions at different places, but certainly be different solutions at different places. Well, I guess yes. that wouldn't be a problem to, to localize or to apply to Cities in the end, yeah. once we have the bases. Yeah, yeah, once we have this sort of thing, yeah. But that's interesting, it's a different approach to this um, setting up of the market. So, advice. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with uh, what Lorna said, but I think I, I, I see the, the advantage of, uh, of making it up as you suggest because I would end up as a, for instance, language learner. I'm a language learner and I would end up getting more advice which I, because Lorna has a very specific question, but sometimes some people don't have such a specific question and you end up getting more advice what to maximize the advantage for you as a language learner. And that would be one of the, uh, one of the things I personally have never ever thought about. I, my Dutch skills are not certified. I mean, they might be right now because I got my degree, but they were not when I started getting my degree. I never thought about it, but if I were in a context where I would need it or where it could be relevant for me, I would think, oh yeah, that's a great advice. And I would not get to it if it was constructed, if the toolkit were constructed in the face of that question advice instead of do from target group. I think you were saying also um, that we should, when we do the structure, we should start seeing what kind of advice we have and then see from the advice how we can work that. Um, yeah, and then having a kind of first entrance level where people would know where to search. But I mean, in a way, when, we, when we're setting up the tool, it's, I mean, on that, I mean, I work on quality of data, so I'm sifting through vast amounts of quality of data and I'm trying to figure out patterns and themes. And then you can figure out perhaps the various routes that emerge through that. And some users will not find our toolkits useful, that's fine, because we're not trying to do everything and we've got limited resources. But maybe we've got a certain amount of really good advice for some people. And we just need to figure out from what we have learned in the past few years what we can share. And beyond that, I don't think we need to worry that we're not reinventing or, you know, necessarily doing more than we can. So, we've a lot to say somehow. I'd, I'd like to echo that because I think that, you know, a toolkit, to only be a toolkit, but all of this is in really great detail for the project in itself. Mm -hmm. And then what we're doing is highlighting, I think, showing the potential as well but also, as I say, concentrating on key areas and looking at giving good advice examples in a, a, in a really targeted way. Otherwise, it could just get so huge as well, and in the end, it would be difficult to access the information as well.
the employer has different different aspects. This would be working company that would further benefit from multilingualism of its um, employees. It could be a company that needs that they have to that the employees have to speak languages for instance it's a culture center and it has clients, international clients. It's a completely different situation. It can be a company which has no need to have multilingual or fully multilingual employees, but they don't speak the language which is normally spoke, spoken in the company. And it is a situation. So the advices could differ depending on the problem that they are expected to solve. And this could be uh, useful for the employer. And if you go back to this line where is the containers, we could make them more talkative if they have directly here some small questions that could attract people, economy. How can my company benefit from English? Private. What I could do if I know more languages? Is something like that? I don't know. That's what you need. I'm going to pay government money for my Sunday language class. <laughs> I mean, it's very specific, but it uh, could also be interesting. But don't you think we would come up with a lot of different problems and a lot yeah. of different questions? Yeah. We don't need to be. I agree that uh, making a complete topic is a separate project. Actually, we can see what comes out of the research from the project. I'm, I'm not involved in the project, so I don't know the, the context of the That's what we need, your advice is but, uh, <laughs> but in general, the idea is that the research has some conclusions. And then we can see, okay, the conclusions that we have from the project, they are relevant to this, this, this situation. And we want to share with you my dear report. I don't know your, your name, I'm sorry, I don't know what, what's Yeah, the red is better. Okay, I still don't know what's going on. I'll do my best. And what you and Norma said is both true. We should be ambitious, but not all-encompassing. So we, we put into this, it's almost a, a first step and doing something very useful. So we put in what we know is useful. We, know we put in what, uh, and I do, the more I hear, think that we do need to have the problems sort of suggested so people can follow a route. And don't forget that the way these things work is that if this works, but it's not complete, then that's the next project. Yeah. Uh, because it could be, if this works and people like it, this could be a really significant database, yeah. eventually. Mm -hmm. But we won't be able to make a significant database which covers everything in six months' time. And the significant database would have an element of interaction, which at the moment we haven't uh, catered for. So in other words, that the users would be putting in the questions, um, to which there would be uh, the possibility of responses. Well, we haven't promised to do that yet, but we could do something that would be useful for people that we can then evaluate and say, okay, we have to find a way of making, we either have to make a way of making this better, or it wasn't a very good idea anyway, so that's fine. That's not being cynical, that's being realistic about what we can do. And I think we can do something on what we've got, which is, we should be pretty good. But it won't cover every possible question that every possible person in every possible country uh, might have about multilingual. Because if we could do that, we would either be very rich or very brilliant or probably both. Um, but there are certain things which recur, aren't there? In, in the research that you've done, uh, we identify phone, it comes from the city reports. We don't have enough data about languages, so what can we do about it? We, we don't know what to do about it at all. So there are, there, are, there are key questions that we know about. I think, Nick, we should probably move on a bit soon. Yeah. And maybe we should, I think we've actually um, covered a lot of the things. We could also just catch up a little bit on time if we did do a thing. Is there anything you and you would like to say before we move on to the next section in the afternoon? Because it's, it's a really, because I know how hard you've worked on your team, and it really is one of these topics which is like, where do you stop once you begin? And, and also it's always like where you start. And it's one of these things, the desire is to get something right 
for the end user. Um, and to really do it, and I think that as long as you, we, you know, we all sort of think of that as well, it's actually helpful, though sometimes it's two steps forward and one step back. But again, I think that when you said it, it can't be something all encompassing. That is a project in itself. But it's to give this indication of, um, and I, I've got a lot out of the, the discussion today, of you know, looking at the importance perhaps of localization. But also then the idea of those in comparison, sometimes where things are very different and where things are the same. The specificity of areas of work, where that is actually fine, but the way you can clarify by questions, the how to, the examples, the what's. And then of course, looking in the medium of it as well, if you're looking at a web-based tool, that's something that will be added on. And the links and choice and pathways, finding your way through solutions to your questions becomes easy. Well, it's, oh. it is very difficult to uh, agree on a, on a structure, how we get advice across to the end users, which is really useful and relevant for them. But we have to decide at some point. I, I, I think what we could do is looking at, I like what Lorna said, of things that we know, let's say we put ourselves as end users in. And actually just see, because that's where you get the system working out, because forget what our questions are, but that's the system and the technique of, of where the flow will come. And I think that it's, again, it's so great that there are people who have come to us from outside of the project, because that's where we're going to, you know, get the ideas that count, because sometimes we're in it, and we see things, and we've been working things very much, you know, from the applied academic angle, but it's sometimes we need to System. So my final plea, I'm looking to Albania, like, anything you would say to us, your last chance for this sort of thing, or shall we move on? No? Anything else? Okay. Thank you very much, Andrew. Then, then this round of applause for what you've done and what you're going to be doing. <laughs> okay, so um, I, um, I've asked um, Maria to, to introduce, say a few things about um, this next section, which is very much um, an idea of um, really sort of highlighting the way that this project doesn't deal with language in abstraction. It deals in the fact that language is part sometimes of problems, in inverted commas, part of the solutions as well. And we've got three topics where we'll have a good 20, 30 minutes of talk um, that hopefully will show the role of language in these areas. So over to you, Maria Stachera from Minister. Well, I'm not part of this university. I'm from Sophie University. I also came here especially for the meeting. And uh, uh, it was my idea to choose these uh, workshops. This was the idea of our hosts from the university. But um, I would like to go along with their choice and uh, we add uh, a few thoughts about whether this is important and not important for us. Because I understand this is a series of uh, informative workshops uh, in which uh, you as our guests from other countries in Europe and of the Balkans can understand some of the specificity of the language situation in this country. So what they have cho uh, chosen as topics are three languages. And each of these, language, uh, of these languages, Romani, Turkish or Russian, has a particular place in this society. And the place they have gained uh, in centuries uh, has a different uh, background, a different logic. First of all, uh, Romani or Roma and um, Turkish language, these are the two languages of what we call the languages of the neighborhood. I can remember my grand, great grandmother admiring uh, in those days what we call them gypsy populations because this word wasn't invented yet, Roma. Uh, that they can speak three languages that you couldn't speak. They could speak, they could communicate in Roma, in Turkish, and in Bulgarian. 
And she would always say, well, look, I mean, they can communicate to everybody. And the neighborhood was actually something like that. This was the house of the Bulgarian family. Next to it was the house of the Turkish family. And then there, somewhere, were moving the Roman families. So that's, these are the most traditional languages in Bulgaria. So we have a coexistence, cohabitation, common influence, and probably uh, I'm going to tell us about the influence between the languages through, throughout the uh, centuries. And so this is something which is around us to the extent that we don't notice it. And I will give you an example about this invisibility. Two or three years ago, we made a, uh, a little study about all our uh, a significant group of Bulgarian uh, first year students at the university uh, trying to develop and to construct and to see what their language profiles are. So what's the languages they will include in their language profiles. So these languages are so common that even if they came from re regions where that was the language of the neighborhood, they wouldn't put it in their language profile. So this is something very traditional. At the same time, uh, these are not languages of national minorities. This is very important for our country to know. These are countries of, uh, these are languages of ethnic minorities. Uh, and in, in this fine uh, our educational system provides opportunities for teaching the mother tongue. And yesterday we had a colleague from one of the agency of the ministry talking about that. But again, a big difference between Roma and Turkish language. They say we have no problem with Turkish language when we have to have classes uh, in mother tongue because we have books from Turkey. But what about Roma? Where are we going to get, get books from? It is too far, she was saying. Yeah. Yeah, what is our, where are we going to get books from? So then a very different status of these two languages in society and also, because of that, the Roma population, the Roma minority, either move more to Bulgarian language or to Turkish, so it's difficult to preserve some of what is considered their language. And why Russian? Nothing to do with these uh, situations. But actually, for many years throughout the 20th century, that was the, or how to say, the dominant foreign language, uh, widely spoken, but I, I said dominant, and I will put it in quotes, because um, this domination was not just an imposition of the language, but that was our resource, because I had my higher education here in Bulgaria, and actually I have read everything that I was interested in, starting from philosophy of language and British act academic uh, analytic philosophy from Russian translations. This was the big source of books and information. That was the language of really high standard education because we live in a closed society, in a society in which we didn't have uh, I mean, those opportunities to travel and to use the resources of other language. So it might be considered in some sense dominant language, but in another sense that was really a window in a very standard way, uh, way to say to the whole world. Uh, also, there is another aspect of that, is that for years, because of this, like with Erasmus today, you know the big success of Erasmus is creating bilingual families. That has been uh, uh, said as one of the big uh, results of Erasmus. That, that is actually what happened in these years. And from the Belarusians who stayed in this country after the, the war liberation at the end of the 19th century, Russia fighting Turkey for uh, liberation of this country and other countries from the Balkans, and most of the Russian army, the Belarusians, stayed here and, and settled in villages, so they become part of the neighborhood in some sense. And more in these 50 years of being close to Russia, we actually have Russian in our neighborhood. So many families, both between Bulgarian and Russian, and I think this is something that we encounter uh, uh, every 
today still. Although for about 15 years, Russia was expelling the well educational system for political reasons. Uh, and you know, for many years, I have my graduation in, in English at the university, but I have in very close contact with the Russian uh, Association of Teachers because I always say that because I mean, some of the results uh, and, and of this development and the success of teaching foreign languages in this country was partially because in fifth grade of school we had to do an intensive study of Russian, no other language, but we could master, I mean in those days I'm sure now, we could master a language that is close, very close to your language, a language which is in your language family much faster than than languages that are a bit far. And so this opened again capacities and abilities uh, and interest uh, to foreign languages. And uh, I'm happy to say this is uh, for the University uh, of Ireland, that they have the Russian Center, and this is exactly the place because Vaughan and Odessa, I mean, this is the, the entrance, this is the border with Russia actually, that's how it is considered, I mean this part uh, of the country. We do not have a physical border, but it's actually it is a border uh, with Russia. And, uh, and the result, uh, and it is really a growing language in this country, in this small survey that we conducted, we found out that after English and German, it was the Russian language uh, which was the most sought out language for uh, learning and study by secondary school uh, uh, students although it has never been in the compulsory program of the school. Uh, 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 so, uh, these are three languages that have a specific uh, influence or characterize in a specific way the language situation uh, uh, in the country. And I think all of you who come from uh, places far away would be interesting, uh, it would be interesting for you to find out more about that. So I don't know whether that was the idea behind setting uh, uh, up of the topic, but that's how I interpreted it. And uh, uh, probably you will introduce the moderators. Absolutely, absolutely no. It's in my, my memory sheet as well. Um, it, I, I, what I thought was wonderful, Maria, that when you talk about languages, and you talk about linguistics and issues, they sometimes can be very abstract. And what you get from Maria's talk there, marvellous, so more than vignettes, but the whole feeling of history, people, times, change, was, was I think, wonderfully actually um, summed up. What we've got um, and, uh, is this opportunity. You've all got coloured little stickers on. The green will stay in this room. The uh, yellow will go by the sea, the big window, not to the beach, not to the Fraser, by the windows, not down to the beach, and um, the, what's the other colour? Um, pink, the Russian group, will just be around the corner here. Um, for a carousel to work, you've really got to be strict on time, and we all have to fit together, otherwise you get that horrible thing of people, move rooms, but um, you um, move from one room to another. Um, I'm very, very grateful that my two colleagues from LSE, that they'll have to stand up with all this embarrassing bit. Peter Skadis, who's head of German linguistics, Argo Sobolida, who's head of Russian and literature, um, are going to be act, and they're also joined in Russian by Boyana Kostova, and in the Turkey section of Petya Simeonova, and then I have Milen Dimov here, um, and we're going to be, as I say, and we the questions, well, I'll let you leave because we, we've gone through this with our moderators, and uh, so the main thing is, it's now almost two minutes past three, we'll be changing at the half hour, see so what half hour there, so if you like to go, so as I say, the pink group just around the corner, and it's all there for you, and uh, the customer down at the
history of the history of the time of the question. So it's six million six hundred years. So it's bilingualism aver aggravated significance in different ways. <laughs> Next to my uh, formal teaching duties, I had a website that we ran together with colleagues a workshop for parents who want to get kids and just have questions. So we, we got practical, even though our background were all here at school. And I quit my linguistic position about two years ago, and I work, now I work in the economics department, but I'm still working with the UC. And very much, and with the project, and with the, the workshops. and. The, I come from the eastern coast near the Paris and in our region most of the business when I was studying Jews at least it was uh, with Russian people and it was clear that they preferred to speak Russian rather than English or other international languages and it was easier and they were going I mean business people from Italy were going to build companies or factories in Russia so they needed to work in this area in Russia. I, I, lots of my friends now work in companies because they learn Russian. Do you want a Russian tourist? <laughs> Sorry? Study here in order to have a group or class. And the second main problem is that, I mean, the reasons are pretty complicated, but there is a lack of qualified teachers. I mean, ready to teach formal language to predominantly common students. Is it something that you feel is well organized in Bulgaria? Something that not well organized, that's for sure, in my humble opinion. Um, but there are more and more successful scholars in the national forum. What are the numbers? Oh, we don't have official numbers. <laughs> We don't have official numbers, I'm also from Bulgaria. We don't have official numbers. Because in the official political statements in Bulgaria, uh, this is, uh, well, your ethical and your religious uh, self consciousness is a private issue and it is under the protection of the law of the private issues. So no administration is allowed to collect in organized way any data about any ethnic, religious or other issues. So all the data that we have is collected by NGOs under different projects, but nobody can sign that it is representative. Because of this, um, we sometimes have very big difficulties in, in planning, in designing all this education, because actually we don't know how many children Needed. Sometimes the parents declare that they are Roma, but they speak in, in, in kind of at home Bulgarian, and this is not true. Sometimes they declare that their mother language is Turkish, which we cannot understand if it is true or not. And sometimes they just uh, don't want to declare anything. So it is very difficult to plan this additional education. And also, according to, to my uh, experience, it is not really working. Because the, the language of the Roma minority in Bulgaria is not regarded as a value. And this is for us a big problem. And it is a problem with integration. The other are ethnical minorities. I have been working for 14 years in the um, Jewish school in Sofia. And Hebrew, which the children from Jewish origin uh, were in the same situation, under the same regulations in school, was definitely valued, very high. And they said, oh, the gypsy children, they want to study and know Hebrew. Great. So they were really supported by the society, by the family, by everybody. And we, we had in this school all the celebrations together, Bulgarian and Jewish children. In this school, we, we had holiday every week. We celebrated all the This is a rather new thing, yeah. at least in our part of the world. Well, I think in another part of the world. <laughs> It's a funny, I personally, I find it's a funny idea that there's language for business and language for something else. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Obviously it is, but it's language. Yes, and 